Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for coming for the next edition of the Active Matter Seminar Series at CMSA. Uh, today, we're delighted to have Nita Packley from MIT, and she's going to be talking to us about uh, active. I don't see your slides. But it, it, it's rotating active matter, living matter. Active matter. matter. Yeah. Perfect. Whoa. Whoa. OK. Yeah. OK, well, uh, first of all, um, thank you very much, Farzan and David, for inviting me to give uh, this talk and also make it possible for me to um, talk over Zoom. Um, as I mentioned, I'm spending two weeks in Germany at the MPI for Dynamics and Self-Organization. I thought may, there's a lot of history here, so I just thought maybe I share a couple of uh, pictures that I've taken. So um, my office is uh, basically uh, this office here. So I'm sitting at the original desk that was used by Ludwig Prantl. And not a comfortable chair, but definitely a lot of history there. And then my apartment is where it belonged to Max von Lauer. And so, um, yeah, that's another kind of interesting uh, fact that I thought uh, I'll share before oh. I start. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so uh, today yeah. I'm going to, uh, to talk about um, a very new direction in my group in trying to understand how time reversal, symmetry breaking, and as well as non-reciprocal interactions, which are two hallmarks of living systems, can fundamentally alter the organization of matter and how it uh, has led us to um, uh, some very interesting experimental observations. And this is um, a kind of like a project that's evolving. And so I'm going to give a very detailed overview of uh, what the system is. And please interrupt me at any time during the talk. And um, yeah, I can um, kind of try to answer uh, uh, the questions as they arise. Um, so first of all, um, let me uh, tell you about what my group is interested in. Um, like many other biophysicists, we are fascinated by the fact that there is something different about being alive. And we would like to know what this is in the same way that we know what it is for a collection of atoms to be solid and for a collection of electrons to be superconducting. When we look around more or less immediately, we can identify things which are alive and the criteria that we use in making a discrimination between animate and inanimate matter has nothing to do with the individual components such as DNA or proteins. Being alive is a macroscopic state while things uh, like DNA and proteins are the components of the microscopic mechanisms by which this state is generated and maintained. I mean, let me elaborate on this idea by talking about this beautiful video that you see on the slide here. This is an Excel or oocyte of a C star. It's a model system that we use in my group. This is a very large cell. It's about 200 micron in diameter. And what you see is self-organized patterns of signaling proteins that allow the cell to perform a very important function very early on in development, namely cell division. Of course, uh, we cannot see individual proteins, and um, a lot of us may not even know what they are, but one thing we can all appreciate, and that's the fact that long wavelength patterns that span the entire surface of the cell uh, self-organize from one state to another. And of course, this happens while the egg cell is continuously consuming ATP and dissipating energy. Of course, molecular biology over the past oh, yeah. uh, many decades Victor, may, may I ask a question? Um, in that, sure. Yeah, in that beautiful movie, um, there was a, um, I apologize if I've asked this to you before, uh, there there's a, seems to be a fertilization point uh, associated with this oocyte, and is that where the waves are originating? Or what? Uh, yes, so, so, right. So uh, actually we haven't fertilized uh, the egg yet. So this is, uh, we have added the hormone which prepares the cell for uh, division. So what the axis of symmetry is, uh, um, so the, the cell has broken symmetry uh, where basically the nucleus is closer to one end of the cell. And that's where, um, kind of, uh, it's, that's one of the poles where basically okay. the opposite pole where the, um, the waves start. 
But what happens is that when it, they get to the other pole, which is around here, you get a polar body extrusion. So the cell gets rid of half of its genetic material, material and that then it's basically ready for symmetric cell division to happen. I see. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, Nick, sorry, uh, I, have, I also have a question here. Um, is the spindle, is, is that the magic spindle, is that already formed inside or does that happen? Uh, when does that happen with regard to uh, the waves, the low waves? Um, right. So, um, hey, Suraj. So, I, if I, 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 what you asked was whether spindle has formed. Yeah. Is that yeah. uh, correct? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so then, right. So, the nuclear envelope has broken down. And uh, in fact, it's basically the spindle is now closer to this pole here, um, um, basically. And then when the waves start, they go from one side to the other side. And then uh, like half uh, one polar body gets extruded, which is basically half of the um, kind of like the DNA material that gets out of the cell. Yes, great, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so um, as I was mentioning, um, I think over the past uh, many decades, molecular biology has been successful in identifying what the components as well as what the microscopic mechanisms are. However, uh, I think there has been less progress in identifying the parameters that are the characteristic of the macroscopic state. And uh, I really like this uh, quote from Ernest Everett Just, who is a pioneering developmental biologist which says that the direct analysis of state of being alive must never go below the order of organization which characterizes life. And of course, if you think about it, this approach is at the heart of physics. One of the fundamental questions in physics is not only discovering the underlying laws in the system, but, is, but in understanding and explaining the new laws that emerge when many individual components interact. And to discover these laws, we do not always keep track of all the electrons and protons. We're always looking for important variables and the key degrees of freedom. And once these key variables are identified, we combine them into what is called an order parameter, which is the quantification of the emergent phenomena. This of course has been, uh, this concept of order parameters has been very powerful in equilibrium physics. It plays a crucial role in defining a, a wide range of phenomena. And of course, a famous example is uh, magnetization. But of course, asking for order parameters of the living state is a much harder uh, problem However, it is crucial if you would like to imagine a physics of life that has the same level of predictive power that is the standard in um, other areas of physics. So my group um, focuses on, um, on identifying or uh, defining this order parameters of this macroscopic state. And what we do, we develop experimental tools to identify and observe um, non-equilibrium uh, degrees of freedom. Data analysis frameworks to define order parameter fields, and we collaborate with uh, my theory colleagues to develop theoretical frameworks that have uh, predictive power. Now, the concepts that we introduce, um, um, you hear about them today, or in general, we use in my group, are system independent. But we always need a model system which has a rich phenomenology. Basically, we need this hydrogen atom. So what we use is an oocyte of uh, C star, which is one of the oldest known developmental biology uh, model system. This is actually a paper that I found, which goes back to 18, um, 1800. And of course, development itself is an um, incredible um, process. It's really an accomplishment in the realm of information because the processes need to be orchestrated in space and time to uh, give you um, robust outcomes. So this is the model system that uh, we use. And um, here I'm oh, highlighting- sorry, 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 can you go back one? Um, the, sure. to what 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 are we looking at here there's is that a nucleus with a nucleolus inside it um yes exactly david so this is the nucleus and then i think you can see clearly here that the cell has broken symmetry even before any of these processes start and and then um the waves that were starting is basically when the nuclear envelope breaks down the wave starts from this pole and they okay. propagate all the way to this side and um, Suraj, that's where the spindle is, and that's where you get the polar body extrusion. Okay. 
And you get these from your own laboratory um, sea stars? Yes. Or? Yes. So we get the sea stars from the coast of California. We have a diver. We call him. He dives and he sends us a starfish. We keep them in the lab. And then we, we can make a small incision. You can get the eggs out. And I'm saying me, I mean, my group, yes, um, yes. They, they, they make a small incision that you can get um, the eggs out. And then basically uh, you get many of them and you can do um, many different types of experiments. And, and the diver can can assess the gender of the sea stars that it's painting. No, no. Mm -hmm. So there are we have. So of course there are many uh, interesting stories when it comes to that in the yes. lab. And of course uh, when we get them, it's basically mixed, and then uh, we actually have to um, kind of like do a gender identification. Okay. And we can't keep them. We can't keep them together. Um, we oh, are yes. interested in the female female starfish and uh, yeah. And so, so there is kind of like ah. a lot of interesting stories there. You have to separate them. Right. Okay, thank you. Right, sure. Um, yeah, so um, I guess here, uh, what I wanted to show is basically highlighting three examples of the broken symmetries that we have uh, quantified and this is ordered by uh, the scale. Um, uh, the first and I think foremost uh, important broken symmetry, which is the defining feature of non-equilibrium systems is time reversal. And uh, my group has shown that fluctuations at the intracellular level, so this is looking at uh, the small scales, actually encodes uh, information about a thermodynamic arrow of time. And we can use uh, tools from stochastic thermodynamic and information theory to quantify what, what I call irreversibility and also identify spatiotemporal scales of the dissipation. And um, if we move up uh, the scale as well as complexity, uh, what we have shown is that uh, you, uh, biochemical signaling proteins uh, self-organize at the cellular scale and cells use these patterns to actually perform computation. And again, we use concepts from um, stochastic thermodynamics, this irreversibility to understand um, the cost of pattern formation or the energetics of pattern formation. And today I'm going to um, kind of move even higher in scale and tell you about how, again, time reversal, asymmetry, and non-reciprocal interactions can give rise to a uh, broken symmetry of the stress sensor and uh, emergence of um, exotic material properties. And again, I'll show you how uh, we can uh, use, um, again, tools from stochastic thermodynamics to quantify um, bounds on work and dissipation in the system. Okay, so uh, let's uh, first uh, focus on um, kind of like the, the model, the system that we use. And uh, again, uh, the, this, uh, what, what, you, what we use is starfish embryo. So uh, I, I started this, I start this video here. And uh, what you see now is that we have fertilized these egg cells. So they undergo the first cell division. This uh, process continues many, many times. So as you can see, um, you're, you have like this, same volume, the cells are uh, dividing uh, many, many times. They now start to um, basically uh, reorganize um, some of the cells. They migrate to the surface, which is basically this uh, periphery that you see here. And these cells have cilia. And uh, cilia is this hair-like organ that um, uh, protrudes from the cells. And it has many functions. It, ha it can be mechanosensitive. It can be used uh, for cell uh, motility. And uh, uh, first they beat asynchronously. And then at some point they start beating synchronously. And that's when you see this washing machine phase. And then um, at some point they actually break free and they start uh, swimming around. Now, um, there are two important broken symmetries here. First of all, time reversal, because you have the natural uh, developmental process that has started. And of course, we also have a chiral symmetry breaking because we have the cilia on the surface. Think of it as a hairy sphere with a certain pa beating pattern, which basically gives rise to a certain uh, chirality. So, now, so, so Nick, can, I, can I ask another question, please? Um, sure. Sure. These, these sea stars are themselves confined in two dimensions. Um, uh, 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 what, what determines their, their rotation axis is perpendicular to some two dimensional confining plane? Right, so, so uh, they're, they're, they're actually three dimensional uh, objects. Uh, yes. Initially they have cilia everywhere. 
And um, actually, um, I don't really know exactly what breaks the symmetry. I think this is actually why we started this project because we wanted to know how they swim. If you look at them, they swim in this um, screwdriver way. Wow. And, and then uh, you know, what happens is now is that some of them, as I, as I will explain uh, in, in, in this slide and the later slides, some wow. of them, they come to the water air interface. And then when you look from the top, they actually have uh, an axis of them. But when the axis of rotation is perpendicular to the surface of air water, it's basically they uh, rotate uh, clockwise. And oh. um, that's a, right. And um, I, I believe it's basically um, the reason that they have like a certain beating pattern. It's probably the same um, kind of uh, phenomena that give rise to left right symmetry breaking. But, um, but uh, for instance, like um, kind of other, we have like in, in other organisms, including humans, like you, you have this cilia beating that gives rise to uh, left right symmetry breaking. It's probably the same kind of, um, I guess, uh, um, maybe circuit or, but, but okay. uh, we're, you, we're looking into details of it. When you refer to humans, you're saying the early uh, stages of human development. Earlier, early. Right, cilia, right. And, and that's related to having hearts on the left side, for example, eventually. Right, exactly, exactly, right, yes. Okay. So make that uh, along the line. So do sure. you know that nodal uh, or uh, analog or homologous nodal are, 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 are responsible for left right symmetry breaking in uh, C cells and cilia? Um, sorry, um, uh, Suraj, oh. I actually didn't hear oh, the uh, question. Uh, the point that you mentioned uh, with regard to ciliary patterning and left right symmetry breaking um, is that. And uh, a homolog of nodal that plays a similar role over here, is that known or is that something that you're looking at? Um, so um, I think it's something I'm reading up. Probably it's known somewhere and like, uh, so, but, but something uh, I'm reading up on it. I, I'm interested in it because at some, I, there was a point that I was thinking if it's possible to kind of like uh, make them rotate, uh, like uh, have a different chirality. Right. And then we've been looking into basically uh, other ways to like, I don't know, like start because this symmetry is probably defined very early in development. Now, whether it's possible to somehow do something to change that, it's uh, again, it's something that uh, we've been reading up on it. And um, yeah, uh, I, I don't have a good question, good, good answer to you, for you right now, but maybe hopefully soon. Okay, thank you. Right. And how do how sure. we how do they what? Sorry. Do they, um, uh, uh, do they also use the cilia to uh, feed? What's the mechanism? Oh, yes, yes. F for feeding, yes. Later. But here, uh, everything they're looking at, they actually haven't started feeding. So okay. it's they're just actually they're closed on like and so they have so everything that I present today they they don't eat they haven't started eating in fact there is a there there is a beautiful work from Manu Prakash's lab where they look at the the larvae and that's the stage where they start eating and then um they were talking about like like the yeah. fluid pattern around and then the feeding mechanism. Yeah. But nothing, no, no feeding happens at this yeah. stage right okay. now. And then just to follow up, in, 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 your, in the movies you showed, uh, those organisms had dividing cells inside a sac, and that was kind of like the analog of a yolk sac, with, with, that's where they're getting their nutrients without the external feeding. Yeah, so, so they're, uh, right, yes, yeah, so they, okay. it's, it's, I think it's remarkable, so they get their nutrients um, like for a long time, and then they, they start feeding um, like, um, Kind of much later after a few days. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, what we basically uh, we decided to do was to put um, a group of these embryos together, and of course we observed this. Uh, what I think is a remarkable phenomenon, and um, I just started the video, and what you see is this spontaneous crystallization of large assemblies of this uh, developing a uh, starfish, and um, they thousands of them come together they form what we call a living chiral crystal and this structure persists for many hours so i just want you to focus on the time stamp as well as the um, uh, length scale here so we're looking at the long time scales maybe i play the video again long very long time scales as well as, well as very large scales like you can almost see them uh, with uh, eye and uh, and of course 
the self-assembly and dy dynamic and the solution is entirely uh, controlled autonomously by the embryo's internal developmental uh, program. So um, I'm gonna first give you an intuition of why actually this happens. So this is a side view of uh, one of these embryos, as you can see here. And what you see is that it's slightly elongated along this, uh, what, what we call an anterior posterior axis or AP axis. And when these embryos swim toward the water air interface, they can attain a stable configuration such that their AP axis align perpendicular to the interface. And, uh, and then now you can see, um, and this um, image here is basically the, uh, the fluid flow that's around uh, the embryo. Now, uh, you have, when you have a group of them together, when they align in this manner, they spontaneously self-organize into two-dimensional hexagonal crystals. Now, as the embryo develops further, you can see that first of all, they become more elongated. The shape um, kind of starts uh, changing, uh, as well as the topology of this self-generated fluid flow near embryos um, surface also changes uh, substantially. And uh, the strength of the flow uh, changes as well. And then uh, that basically leads to an order to disorder uh, transition, and then eventually the complete uh, dissolution uh, of the crystal. And uh, let me show you um, kind of like a close up of like small clusters of this. So this is um, kind of clusters of um, very early on. Um, you can see that um, like in uh, basically these are pretty ordered. You have really nice packing. And then at longer times, you can see that the shape has already become uh, less uh, disordered. And basically uh, you can see that they become, they, 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 dis, um, they destabilize at the interface, they swim away. And you, that's basically um, kind of like in addition to other uh, noise in the system, you get this final um, kind of like order, you get an order to disorder transition and then finally the complete dissolution. So Nikta, are there okay, optional so, consequences for right. this? Sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Yes. Is there any functional consequence of this uh, organization that you're seeing when you have multiple embryos? Or is this is something that you created just so um, um, so I think that's that's a very interesting question that um, so we haven't done anything different. So what, all we did is we just increased the density. that's that's basically all we did. And uh, there is no confinement or, I mean, okay, so first we started with very large wells. So we put them in wells and then first we started with very large wells and in large wells, what happens is that you actually have multiple um, kind of um, uh, multiple of these uh, clusters form. So you don't get um, kind of like a final big cluster forming. And, um, and then uh, it's, and then when you have, so we decided to go to a smaller well so that we can actually grow a much bigger crystal. So we haven't done anything differently about the system. Of course, this could very well be an epiphenomena, but whether an epiphenomena is, becomes a phenomena because there is something um, like favorable for them. I mean, maybe that's like an equivalent of flocking or, uh, I, I don't really know. I mean, I don't think anybody has ever looked into kind of like to see if this is exact, this is what happens. But what I have been reading up is that, of course, this happens in the zooplankton and there is a lot of other organisms all have like this type of kind of chiral uh, symmetry breaking, a lot of other features. So it's not unimaginable that something like, like this could happen. But again, I, I don't really have any evidence for it. But what I can say is that we haven't done something um, like really drastic to make this happen. Thank you. Sure. Could, could I ask uh, Nikta, um, there, there, there's of course this chirality and I guess that cilia that are poking out from the, each of these cell clusters, each circular thing is a cluster of developing cells and the cilia are poking out to generate these flow patterns. Is that the right? Right, right. I, I, exactly. So each of these, uh, like basically kind of like spheres or um, like elongated objects that you see from the top, they have cilia, ciliated cells on the uh, interface. And then okay. uh, basically they're beating and that's where we are. Um, so, and, uh, and uh, actually that's a very, that's, thank you for asking that question because I can also mention that. So, uh, I mean, these cilia are actually long. I mean, they're about um, like five to 10 micron. So it is entirely possible that you have 
some type of steric interaction or some kind of interaction between the cilia themselves as well. So it's um, kind of, um, uh, yeah. So I, I know I'm, I'm saying that because I was giving this talk at uh, Penn the other day. And of course, Tom Lubensky was asking whether this is just fluid around them. But I actually think that wow. they're, they, they, they are closer to being like a, a elastic, viscoelastic um, kind of crystal because of, again, this interactions between the cilia themselves as well. I saw someone had their hand up in the Zoom audience. They want to talk. Yeah. So is there a mechanistic understanding of why these cells, they want to stay together and when they want to migrate? I mean, do they respond to some chemical gradient or some other gradients or some other factors? So, so there is no, uh, the only thing I can think of is oxygen. So, I mean, they come to water air interface and I, I, would think maybe it has something to do with like uh, oxygen. And in fact, I was reading and it, it's like actually at night, um, like this zooplankton, like there are populations of uh, species that come to water or interface at night. I mean, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, maybe that's maybe that's one reason that they come um, like to water okay. or interface. Okay, but once they're there, there are capillary forces that are pulling them together and that, that's why things crystallize independent of the chirality? Um, I don't think there are, uh, I mean, that there, there, there could be capillary forces as well. I think what, what we think is basically like, uh, so these are like, you can, these are Stokes that, I mean, you can, the Stokes that basically describes um, um, okay. kind of yeah. like, and, and we think that like the interaction between the Stokes that is basically you get like um, attractive interaction between so the Stokes and yeah. that, but that will do it, right, right. Okay. I would have thought that might be repulsive, but I don't, I guess I don't have good intuition for the Stokes. But... No. All right. Okay, right. So, um, yes, yeah, so um, this is, um, again, uh, if you uh, look from the top, so this is basically, again, a video of, you can see closely that they're basically rotating um, like um, um, in, in, the in the cluster. And of course, this rotation also um, kind of transfers to the whole crystal. So you, all the crystals, they actually have this uh, chiral global rotation which is um, kind of a consequence of a single embryo um, uh, rotation, as you can see um, in um, this image and this video here. Now, um, one um, kind of other interesting thing about their structure is that they're, they have a, a high uh, degree of hexagonal order. They, also, they can also have uh, lattice defects and you can get defects uh, different ways. So, you can have misaligned embryos. So this is like an example of an embryo that somehow has um, kind of like it's, it's sitting on its side. And this type of embryos, they can uh, introduce a sevenfold uh, coordination. You can have missing embryos. Like this is an example of a missing embryo where you can have a fivefold uh, vacancy defect. And you can also have bound defects, which I will actually talk about uh, in a later, towards the end of uh, my talk. And that's kind of like also an interesting, um, um, uh, we, we observe those as well. Okay, so uh, to understand. Can I ask a quick question about uh, sure. what you mentioned earlier uh, about the interface? Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. the, this is at an air water interface and uh, is, which way is gravity? Pointing down. Pointing down. And have, is, is that relevant? Because these clusters are fairly big, right? And so does that right, right. Does that mattering at some point? Right. So I, I think maybe just maybe if I get to this, it kind okay. of becomes clear that uh, what the Stokes that is really doing, right? So, um, so first of all, um, of course, um, so we kind of like we uh, that, that we 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 hypothesize that it's really the hydrodynamic interactions that's driving the formation of and rotation of the crystals. So what we did is we analyzed the fluid flow around individual embryos that's uh, that are that are spinning upright near air water interface. And what you can see is that fluid moves radially inward towards the embryo. It reaches a maximum speed lateral to the embryo surface and then eventually moves towards the bottom of the well. And the radial inflow that's generated by this um, isolated embryos, it can accurately be captured by a Stokeslet 
um, just a solution to the Stokes equation that describes a generic flow around um, a force exerting object. And um, the cilia driven fluid flow compensates the gravitational force act on the negatively buoyant embryos. And so that it can maintain a fixed position um, kind of below uh, this uh, water or interface. And uh, this uh, self-generated um, Stokes slit um, not only stabilizes the upright AP axis orientation of the embryo, it additionally induces an effective long range hydrodynamic attraction between the embryos, which basically facilitates the assembly of these long lived cl clusters at the water air interface. Now, what you see is that when two embryos come uh, mm -hmm. close together, their intrinsic spinning motion uh, also leads to an additional exchange of hydrodynamic force and torque, which are non-reciprocal um, in um, non-reciprocal um, in nature, and that's kind of why it, this uh, system exhibits some really interesting behavior, as you can see later in in in, in my talk. And Be so, can I when ask these... a question here? sorry, may I ask a question here? Sure. You, you, you've been saying sure. Stokeslets, uh, but in fact, uh, at least the naive Stokeslet. Um, you'd have problems with boundary conditions if you're at an interface. So you have to be careful to make sure that you have the right kind of decay in the far field, number one. And number two, um, are these more like rotlets rather than stokeslets? Because you essentially have things which are spinning. And so you've got to have the right kind of, again, um, uh, right. description. So maybe you're using stokeslets stokes as a general um, uh, higher order um, Right. Um, like or so, like structure. I'm, I'm just curious what what exactly is the form of the decay in the velocity, because it's going to do, do yeah. very differently in the plane than out of the plane, precisely because it's at an interface. Right. So so um, this kind of like actually the the theory uh, has been uh, developed by Alex Mitke, who's a postdoc in your Donkel's group. And um, he um, kind of like has, um, I guess, I wish he was here today. So he has basically, I mean, he has looked into all these kind of like, um, I mean, um, uh, uh, I guess, features that you've mentioned. And the Stokeslet uh, captures like the, um, the, again, like this is an, exp like for instance, if I go back, this is an experimental um, kind of like flow field. And then uh, this is, um, again, um, the But what's theory, happening in the third dimension? Uh, um, you're right. So I, 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 yeah, he, so we actually have, we, we have actually also um, kind of imaged the fluid flow in the third dimension. And then he uses um, kind of like the, uh, those uh, parameters that we get from the experiment to, to, to do the fits. And that's what uh, he gets. I can, I, I, I think I, I can give you more um, kind of detailed information, maybe um, like offline, okay. um, if, uh, like if that makes sense, right? Sure. So maybe I'm going to show this. And it's another question. Uh, how does the rotation velocity of the crystal depend on the size of the crystal? Is it is it independent of the size or what? Uh, no, that I, I think that's also kind of like it's in fact uh, when uh, so uh, they have a rotation um, kind of um, frequency. And then, yeah. of course, as they as they come together, like when even when two or three come together, uh, the rotation frequency decreases a little bit. And of course, as the crystal gets bigger and bigger, the rotation frequency of course, uh, decreases uh, as well, goes down and as well. The law right? that by which it slows down is just, uh, you can easily infer it just by looking at the Stokes drag of a bigger and bigger object with growing force. Um, uh, right. So yeah, I, I think it's basically a, a number of different um, kind of, of effectively, it's basically just the size, increase in size explains this. But of course, a lot of things happen as well. Like, first of all, again, we have cilia that's kind of like uh, comes out of the surface. And then as you kind of start packing them, the cilia, of course, starts interacting more as well. And that's an, an additional um, kind of um, interaction. Also, this whole thing is in a fluid. So the bigger it gets, of course, you also have like kind of, I think there's a number of different um, kind of uh, other um, uh, important factors as well. But but that's it. Yeah. Like, that's what we basically observe that kind of like the- it's, uh, Do you right. ever see rotating grain boundaries in the larger wells? 
Um, yeah, so maybe I can actually just, uh, so I'm gonna skip the um, kind of the, the, the model. And um, of course, uh, Maha, I'll be happy to talk about the details of this later. So, or get to this one, which is, uh, I guess, answers uh, uh, your question, David. So we're basically, what we did is we, um, we looked at um, kind of, um, the kind of like we defined this um, to look at the order, um, the crystal order. We looked at the um, the this uh, the basically orientational order parameter. So you can see basically this is this is a video of how uh, you can. Um, so this is the magnitude of psi six. This is the phase of psi six. You can see that we have we have grain boundaries. Um, they kind of like they start healing like when the crystal becomes more ordered. And of course, it's um, like as the so, so you we basically have crystals come uh, actually different um, clusters coming together. That's where you have these boundaries, yeah. and the boundaries, of course, it's um, like they 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 heal, and then of course it's uh, um, right. And and where this is, these are kind of like the original experiments we did. Um, I think well, um, one of my students right now, maybe you Chen, she's in the audience. What we are doing now is we are kind of like, we're actually taking this crystal, we're confining it into uh, a, a, ch a chamber where we can actually, if we wanted to apply compression um, type, for, uh, type uh, forces. And there you can really nicely see like how you can uh, kind of like, you can look at the dynamics of this grain boundaries and uh, other type of defects that you have uh, in the system. Thank you. Sure. Um, right. So uh, yes. So um, again, like I guess this was um, good to show, and maybe uh, this is just uh, it's it shows like how basically this um, order parameter um, evolves over time. And again, you can see that we have small clusters that merge together along different um, um, and crystal axes, so that we end up having these grain boundaries. Which is um, and uh, kind of in, in, is indicated in this broad distribution of uh, the magnitude and phase of uh, the orientational order parameter. Then, however, as basically um, the kind of like the uh, development progress, the crystals become more ordered. Uh, you end up with um, nearly defect-free crystals with like a high degree of hexagonal order, and then this narrow distribution of the local bond orientation. And, and again, um, like as the development progress uh, and I think um, noise and um, kicks in, you have this order disorder transition uh, and um, kind of which is again, it's um, evident in the distribution of the magnitude and um, uh, phase of the size six and then eventually you have the, the solution. Now, um, again, I guess, uh, this would be repeating it, but you can also look at like different, um, not just structural order, but also dynamic order, for instance, by looking at um, a, a dynamic minimum parameter. And again, you can see this uh, clear uh, order disorder transition and a destabilization of the crystal lattice uh, like towards the end of uh, crystal, um, um, I guess, um, dissolution. But let me get to the, 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 the most interesting part of this, which is uh, the question is, okay, we have this non-reciprocal interactions and what is the consequence of this breaking parity when we spin uh, the material consequence, uh, material constituents. And um, when you have the presence of this transverse, uh, transverse forces and torques. So um, again, just the, the reminder that we, when two of them, when two of this, um, um, chiral objects, they come together, they exchange a transverse force, um, they exchange um, non-reciprocal forces and uh, torques. And what happens was something actually was quite remarkable. So what I'm showing you now is a video of the crystal now in the co-rotating frame of the crystal. And um, I hope Zoom is giving enough uh, resolution for you to see that you actually see um, self-sustained oscillations that persist for very long times. And again, this is absolutely uh, surprising because uh, and we, when we first saw that, we, we thought maybe somebody shakes the table. So we repeated this, we repeated it many, many times. And this is a really a robust feature of the system. So, so far, many people have tried this and it's, I, I, it was just a, absolutely a remarkable uh, thing to observe. And of course, this really got us excited to um, kind of uh, go and um, look at um, the beautiful theory that Vincenzo and his group developed. So I'm going to uh, spend the next uh, uh, 
kind of maybe few slides talking about how what we actually learned from this. So just to uh, kind of show you, uh, the, to uh, allow you to better visualize this um, kind of oscillations, uh, you can look, we can look at the displacement fields. And um, in the displacement field, now you can see uh, this propagation of the self-excited uh, waves that, again, they're persisting for um, hours, uh, longer than hours. And again, this is, should come as a huge surprise because this is, of course, an overdamped uh, system. And um, of course, this is uh, not expected. So, um, yeah, actually, so on the point of being overdamped, uh, what is the Reynolds number? Because the speeds, if I remember, were on the scale of millimeters per second, or maybe small uh, one hand per that, and sizes on the right. scale. What is the typical Reynolds number? Um, so I should know that number from the top of my head, but I don't, but it's actually, it's, it's um, kind of like uh, we are in the low Reynolds uh, number regime. So I, I, I'm sorry that I don't have that number from the top of my head, but uh, yeah, right. Um, Can I ask a question over here? If you had sure. the ability to tune down uh, activity by, for example, maybe gently poisoning the system, um, of course, you lose both the uh, internal degrees of freedom and this overall rotation. But if you were to then rescue the overall rotation by basically having a magnetic stirrer or something like that, um, can you separate out what might be hydrodynamic modes induced by the rotation coupled to elasticity and truly active modes? Um, I think, uh, Maha, that's, that's a dream experiment to do. So. Uh, we tried um, kind of like a, a, not a lot, but we tried a little bit to see if we can poison the salts by um, removing um, kind of what by uh, depleting ATP. I think um, it was a little hard to kind of like, I mean, we, to keep them alive so that they can do all these things. I think that's just uh, that's that's we haven't really found that sweet spot to be able to kind of really bring it close to near um, kind of like but is there dead a alive and. Is there an analog experiment if you can construct some sort of Cheerios like crystal and then spin it and see whether there are internal modes which are actuated by the global rotation? Because there are soft modes, presumably right. long wavelength scale soft modes. Right. And maybe I'm asking the question slightly differently. Perhaps you're going to show us how the strains behave rather than displacements, because those are probably slightly better right. ways of characterizing things. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm going to talk. I'm going to okay. show you that uh, in a minute as well, right? Uh, but but uh, oh, okay. I, on my wish list of um, experiments to I do is if that. somehow we can there put we um, kind of magnetic beads somehow on the surface or inside this, um, and then actually apply a magnetic field from outside to see if we can kind of like make them stop and um, yeah. do yeah. like awesome. bend them. Do, do. Right there. Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a raised hand from uh, oh, all right. Right. Hi, Nikta. Um, Hello. Hi, uh, Hi, Severin. Yeah, beautiful talk so far. Um, I, uh, I have more clarification questions. So if I interpret this correctly, uh, you showed the crystal rotating in the rotating frame. So this is mostly a solid uh, type of rotation. Is that induced uh, basically by the, the cells that are at the edge and those cilia basically all beating in the same directions? communicate this rotation to the crystal. And then because all the cells are attractive and sort of glued to each other, uh, they can maintain this kind of solid crystal uh, stage and don't break up into uh, smaller crystals. And kind of follow uh, follow up question, can you tune this cell cell adhesion maybe by genetically modifying the number of cilia you have around the cells or finding other strains that have a different number and different uh, adhesive mm -hmm. forces between them? Mm -hmm. um, both very interesting questions. So the, to the answer your first question, so all of these um, kind of each individual embryo is rotating. Of course, as they're more inside the kind of like the road, there, there is a kind of like a gradient of rotation frequency as you go closer and closer to the edge. And then of course, like the ones that are on the kind of outside, so all of them still rotate. And there are the ones that are outside are rotating faster because they have like one um, less boundary. 
And uh, in fact, you see some interesting things. Like I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the videos, but if you have like another cluster come in, you can actually see that the other cluster somehow shears around um, like this new, this big cluster. And then that's how it orients like around, like basically merges with the new cl cluster. So that's, um, so, it may be that like uh, still like it's single embryo rotation of like somehow all gets propagated to the whole rotation of the whole um, kind of cluster together, right? That that's that's one thing that I can, I don't know if fully answers your first question. The second question, whether we can change um, the interactions between them. Um, it's not, it's, it's a very interesting idea. I, um, one thing I can tell you is that as actually the development progress, the cilia organization around the embryo changes. And first you start with having cilia like everywhere, and then somehow you end up with a ciliary band. And that I think is kind of like why you actually the crystal like starts like, um, I mean, we, we put all of these things in a, like, uh, in a kind of coarse grained way of saying, okay, there's like noise and the cilia, the fluid flow changes. But in fact, it's also the, the, the cilia interactions probably changes because now you go from like having something that's fully covered with cilia to something that's like now like it's a ciliary band and it's different. And in fact, it starts that that's when you start seeing dissolution happens. But if there is a way to control this, uh, I think that that's an interesting question. I don't really have a good answer for it, but something we can definitely look into. Right, thank you. Uh, Nisha, just following up on, on that uh, comment and point, mm -hmm. um, have you played uh, have you played with the viscosity of the liquid or, or even thinking of adding depletants, maybe a small amount of polymer uh, to mm -hmm. help tune uh, the spacing and the adhesion, quote unquote adhesion between the embryos? Right. And um, also a great idea. So first of all, these are um, kind of like, these are in seawater. So it's like, it's, uh, you really need to be careful with osmotic pressure and everything, because of course this this like the, you, they, 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 they want to be in seawater. So we haven't tried any depletants or, I mean, I guess um, kind of like, it's, uh, there's the, like, um, I would say like this project started like maybe over a year ago in my group and it's just a list of things that I want to try, my students want to try, it's just uh, like, it's huge. It's a huge phase space. And I can actually, towards the end, I'll show you like where we're thinking about mixing particles of different identities or developmental. So there's a lot to explore and we're kind of like slowly going down the list and kind of like uh, going there. But, but it's great ideas for uh, just looking at like, um, maybe changing the interactions by introducing depletants or um, kind of viscosity or things like this. Um, okay, so, uh, right, so uh, um, I guess, okay, so uh, this was the displacement field, so, um, right, maybe I would just very quickly, um, I guess, um, um, uh, maybe mention why we should be surprised of in, about have, getting this um, kind of uh, elastic uh, waves in this overdamped regime, and this is, of course, um, kind of, um, uh, like, absolutely beautiful work from Vincenzo, so I I'm going to uh, take a few minutes to just uh, tell you if you are uh, just to refresh your elasticity theory and that's if you have a regular elastic medium of course it's uh, readily um, kind of uh, restores its uh, equilibrium configuration before it has a, a chance of showing oscillatory behavior and if you look at the uh, standard elasticity the um, kind of the entries of this stiffness uh, tensor is uh, derived under a variety of assumptions and uh, energy conservation is um, a common requirement with, of, which of course has um, important consequences. And in the case where you have a two dimensional isotropic material, what it gives you is that it, uh, it's basically, it constrains the stiffness tensor to only two uh, diagonal uh, components, which is one um, uh, the denoted here with B, it's the bulk modula, uh, modulus, which, um, links um, um, kind of compression to pressure. And the other one is uh, the shear modul modulus with, which connects uh, shear strain to shear stress. And of course, what uh, Vincenzo's group have, has shown is that if you um, basically waive this standard requirement of energy conservation, you can um, 
basically unravel unexpected mechanical um, behavior. And in the case, again, if you have a two-dimensional isotropic material, you get two uh, entirely, and I'm, I'm gonna focus on a two, uh, two of these um, components here. Two, you have two entirely new elastic moduli, which one is um, A, which is coupling compression to an internal torque density, and then uh, a K naught, uh, which is uh, an anti-symmetric uh, shear coupling. And um, now if we look at um, kind of like, if we take this uh, system and uh, visualize uh, the displacement, I actually look at the displacement gradient tensor and extract the four principal pulp components of uh, the strain, um, namely divergence, curl, shear one and shear two. Again, uh, this is a chymograph looking at the edge of the crystal. And it, you can see now that uh, you have this uh, sustained periods of oscillation um, evident from other crystal. So uh, Mahai, I hope this is um, kind of what you were referring to. So, uh, and um, moreover, if you look oh, at- sorry, uh, sorry, Another question. Can you comment on uh, capital lambda as opposed to A? So there's no, those are two independent uh, constraints when you have this situation, sort of equilibrium situation. Uh, right. So um, this is, uh, I, I guess, uh, um, basically the, the lambda is as kind of like, again, it comes from um, re removing the energy conservation. Okay. The, uh, the, gam the gamma is, uh, uh, I think they both, um, uh, the gamma is solid body rotation. And I think it's uh, uh, when you have interactions with an environment, that's yes. um, as, as far as I understand, that's kind of like where you can get um, like this, like this one and also in the, case where you um, kind of really uh, relax the energy conservation you get uh, the the lambda um i mean um, this is uh, it's um, maybe vincenzo can comment on this better than me but so we what what you will see later in my talk is we make an assumption that in our system we can have all of these components available and then okay. what we are doing right now is we're trying to uh, fit uh, the strain fields, for instance, the strain field around a defect to in kind of like um, making no, uh, basically fitting all of these things. And of course, we don't have now a good way of, um, we don't really have absolute uh, moduli, but we can, what we have is uh, the signs. So we know what the signs should be and the signs that we get from the fits are consistent with basically kind of like the, this, um, the, 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 the microscopics of our system. So that's as far as um, I can say we've gotten. I think we have, a raised, right. we have a raised hand from both Vincenzo and Maha. So maybe they can go. Right. Vincenzo, do you want to say something? Oh, yeah, I was just wondering, Maha, do you want to go first? Wait, wait, or... Vincenzo, go ahead. No, you go ahead first. First of all, thanks for the beautiful talk. You may hear a, a shouting cat in the background. I tried to lock him up, but he's very sad again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, there's one thing I want would like to say that I think connects a bit to Maha question. In addition to the uh, to the strain versus stress curve that, that you're describing, you could add to this equation a, a, a vector. Okay. Right. <laughs> this vector would contain, for example, the ordinary pressure, but it would contain also mm -hmm. the ambient torque density, a torque density that exists even prior to you applying any deformations. And I guess one of the peculiarities of your beautiful system and anything made of spinning things is that when two of the spinning objects rotate, um, even before you, you, you change their relative spacing, um, they sort of rub each other. And as you said, they, um, um, they, they will want to naturally rotate around the center of mass. So the, the transverse interactions in the system are also giving you the ambient torque density. So then, uh, and they're giving you, of course, also the elasticity. In that sense, you could say that that A coefficient, um, if you wrote that extra vector, that A coefficient would be an extra term in a gradient expansion. But there's also a leading order one, which is this ambient torque density, which probably plays a role also in your rotation. And um, and it would be interesting to see if it can be factored in some mm -hmm. of your analysis. Mm -hmm. Long comment. Okay, yeah, well, thank, thank, thanks for that comment, Brad. Yeah. So, Maha? Uh, yeah, sorry, as if that was not enough. Uh, um, you were looking at trying to characterize shear and 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 curl and divergence, but maybe you said this and I missed it. 
there probably is also a time dependent aspect to this because it's not clear that you just have things which are in phase, you probably have things which are out of phase. So this may not just be odd elasticity, it may also have a contribution from odd viscoelasticity. And then as Vincenzo said, this becomes even more messy because you can couple stresses to torques and vice versa, if I understand correctly. So this is right. perhaps is a beautiful system which is perhaps even more rich than <laughs> what you already I, showed. I, 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 I'm not going to disagree with that. I think this is an absolutely rich system. And I, I mean, if, if I can maybe just go even further, like I can just move a little further. I mean, I, I can show you, you can, you can do even more. You can just start mixing things and then just creating phases of this. Um, like this is an example of mixing particles of, and then you start getting phase transitions and, and then another thing that you can do is basically you can like, I mean, these are the other examples that you've done where basically you compress it and then you look if you get um, kind of like rotations. So I think it's just for us, it's really a playground for um, kind of like testing a lot of this really beautiful theories that are now kind of uh, that, that exist. But of course we started by just saying, okay, like, I mean, again, like, observing oscillations uh, was just like, it's, it was unexpected. And of course, odd elasticity was the first thing that we thought about. But then of course we need to um, kind of like keep in mind that could be viscoelasticity and uh, even kind of like a, a much richer dynamics as you mentioned. So, so yes, I will not disagree that it, this was for us, it was the first order creating this system and then the first order analysis of what we think is happening in the system and of course just started building on it um, okay. hopefully with more um, clever ways of doing the experiments and um, manipulating the system can, can i can i ask one more question in terms of comparison i think there were some experiments in joe howard's group maybe 10 15 years ago associated with mm -hmm. a bound um, spermatozoa where i think there were a bunch of spermatozoa mm -hmm. at high concentrations which started to essentially form vortex crystals is there any mm -hmm. connection at all to the kinds of phenomena that, that they saw, which I don't recall very in any detailed way, and what you're seeing? Um, so I, I also don't recall the details of it. I, I think the dimensions are just very different. I mean, we were looking at millimeter size, um, like structures and- Does that matter? Like, the Reynolds numbers that, are small? Why does it matter? Unless you're thinking about fluctuations. Um, Right, so um, so I, I, I mean, I, I also think that probably there you have like interactions with the surface. This is, I mean, of course, this is another type of interaction. But um, just um, I, I should like we should look into that. But I um, kind of like I think there will be some kind of like differences, but maybe some, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll make this is all uh, very fast. Since it's around. Two and a half. We started a few minutes late, so if you could uh, possibly wrap the next ten or so minutes, that would be great. Okay. Oh, okay. So I still have ten more minutes. Then, then uh, maybe I will just show you. Um, um, I mean, I'm also happy to answer questions, but then maybe I show you like some of the stuff we have done again. Like so, one is basically now looking at um, the two component, like basically phase space of the shear one, shear two, and as well as divergence curl component. And again, we used um, our ideas from how we kind of like quantify uh, the bounds on work or dissipation in systems like this. And uh, like we, where uh, we kind of like, so we look at the cycles, we look at the currents, and then we can um, put bounds on like the kind of like the irreversibility in the system. And if these are uh, irreversibility maps as uh, you get into the, this oscillation phase. And again, you can see that as you get to this oscillation phase, irreversibility or like, it's probably a bound on work uh, uh, on the system or the work that um, the crystal is doing on the environment. You can see that it's, uh, it's basically increases. And you can also see uh, closer to where we have defects or uh, where we have this, this, uh, this locations, you also see more of this um, irreversibility. And again, this is another direction that we are trying to see um, kind of if we can relate this to kind of, of course, um, tools from, I mean, I mean I'm thinking about, um, um, I guess, uh, thermodynamics of the system and try to extract uh, information this way. Um, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt again, uh, but with regard to the university and work, so if I understand correctly, 
this is an estimate for the amount of energy dissipated or to, to bound, lower bound from the current fluctuations that you have. Right. Uh, but you don't, do you, is there a way to directly access or estimate how much actual work is being performed or is either being extracted from or, or pumped into the fluid? And if it has a right. uh, uh, consequence, I mean, yeah, is it, is, uh, are the embryos using these waves to synchronize their development or, or uh, coordinate their ciliary landing uh, mm -hmm. or something else? Right. Um, re uh, really interesting ideas. I mean, what we had in mind was to somehow get like, again, like start building uh, things like this, um, devices like this, and then start basically seeing if we can kind of really measure the work somehow or like measure, but uh, um, or couple the work to some other kind of um, so we're, we're, it's really all ideas. Um, I'm okay. probably will be thinking out loud about like, but uh, obviously uh, really interesting directions to go. Everything I showed you right now is just really kind of like just um, information theory, like looking at the cycles and extracting um, um, kind of information that way, but not, not we don't really now have any kind of like, um, I mean, we don't really know what that scale is so that you can convert it into work or like um, actual, but but it's it just shows you that these cycles is basic, that the sign of the cycle is actually, cons so if you look at the microscopics of this system, I mean, you have this lubrication of the two particles and then like based on, based on the rotation of the individual com like um, crystals, again, it's something that um, Vincenzo's group has shown, like you can show that there has to be as far as a certain sign for these cycles and what the signs that we get for the cycles are consistent with the microscopics of our system. And it's consistent with the system doing work on the environment. Okay, thank you. So that's, uh, that's, that's uh, sure. Okay, so maybe I will mention um, just, um, I mean, these are again, like new uh, things that we are uh, trying to um, kind of understand. The other, like one, of course, natural thing to look at in particular, Again, we don't really have the scales to be able to um, kind of extract bulk or the, the moduli, but what we wanted to do was to see if we can get the ratios and the signs, uh, in particular from the strain fields around uh, the uh, dislocations. This, this so again, um, this is um, work from uh, Vincenzo's group. So we've also been looking at basically um, kind of like uh, the, the, the Burgers vector and its relation with uh, to the axis of elongation. Of course, in the case where you have um, kind of um, a, a, a normal elastic system, um, there is um, kind of like um, uh, just a simple relation between this, uh, uh, this alpha, again, axis of elongation and the Burgers vector. And you have this discontinuity at uh, um, phi equal, equals to pi half. And then when we do measure this for like, for instance, like this is an example of a five, seven defect, we measure this um, kind of like alpha and phi. And then we can see that you actually have this um, kind of, the, we have this continuity and uh, the, the dashed lines are for um, a, sol a kind of like a two dimensional isotropic passive solid. And the, the line, the fit here is um, including um, all the components, in the base, both the kind of like the, uh, the all the off diagonal components as well as um, the gamma here. And this is basically the fit that we have to, to, the, to the experimental data. And again, what this gives us, again, if we, we can extract the ratios of um, the, the moduli, uh, the signs seem to be consistent with um, kind of, again, the microscopics of the system, but, uh, but this is as far as we've gotten in, like I, I, the final thing would really be to be able to measure the, the bulk moduli and um, kind of like extract this, yeah, had been chosen. Nick, I think in your very elegant paper, you characterized actually your microscopic interaction fairly well in, in terms of mm -hmm. parameters. Um, now, it's, of course, difficult to assume here that these are pairwise interactions, but if you took that yes. through assuming pairwise interaction, then we do have expression mm -hmm. starting from the microscopic transverse forces of what the moduli are. Mm -hmm. So you could even mm -hmm. see whether quantitatively your microscopic model is consistent with the parameter that you extract here. Right. 
Yeah, in fact, that's what. So we we are revising that manuscript. In fact, what's that? What we that's what we did. So we're about to submit the revisions. Uh, Alex, what Alex did is he started from the hydrodynamic equation that uh, well, with, we had the microscopic interactions. He has coarse grained it. So now he has like basically just following what um what you and your group has done. And he, I mean, when I mentioned the signs and kind of like um like the the, the ratios and uh, so it's basically going from the microscopics of our system basically to uh, to the coarse grain model and extracting those uh, coefficients that way so yes thank you for that um right. and so just just uh, for the non cognoscenti the, the, what you get out of this fit are these parameters uh, that vincenzo et al have provided nu and gamma one gamma two and those are in turn related to ratios of the six objects in the uh, Elasticity matrix. Yes, they are related to that. Yes. Um, so, so again, we can get the ratios and um, kind of like ultimately, of course, and and the signs, the ratios, but of course, ultimately, we need to have like kind of like we, we need to do fluctuation dissipation. Like we need to we need to know kind of like what the what the like what scales are to be able to convert this to actual um, kind of moduli, and so, that that is. Okay, and then maybe Vincenzo or you could answer if, if k zero were not exactly equal to minus k zero, that there's anti symmetry were present, what terrible catastrophe would happen in your experiments? Would you see that in some dramatic way? Um, I don't think so. I, I think. First of all, if the, if the solid is isotropic, there's no particular way of doing that right but even if you did i think that the the, I mean, the expression in fact you see there it depends on u naught which is just this um uh, odd um odd coefficient that is not sensitive to the it's not sensitive to even part uh, too much i mean but okay i mean it'd be interesting to see if, if you didn't impose that anti-symmetry in the lower right corner what, what you know could, could you did see that experimentally or show that it was anti-symmetric experimentally. Maybe that's asking too much of these already beautiful experiments. I think that if, if that thing was purely symmetric, David, if uh, K naught, if the two off diagonal entries were exactly identical and did not have an anti-symmetric component, yes. that new naught coefficient that uh, Nikta is writing there would be strictly zero. So if, if Nikta measures a non-zero new naught, then she knows that she has uh, at least some anti-symmetric component in that matrix. So it would be a smoking gun if this is done, uh, you know, carefully. And then if she can mm -hmm. take microscopic force for the interparticle forces, use the coarse mm -hmm. grain formulas that that we can that we can write down and check that that's consistent with what she extracts. Right. Then that would be, I think, a really uh, top-notch uh, thing to do. Thanks. It sounds like your cats also have an opinion, but we should probably move on. <laughs> sounds like the Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I, I, I know I've gotten to the last, I mean, basically um, final uh, minutes. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll mention this again. Like, I think this is uh, just uh, like, again, for us, this is just has opened up a whole new way of thinking about like, um, 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 systems in terms of like again this non-reciprocal type interactions and again like a uh, uh, like paper from uh, Vincenzo's group where they talk about a non-reciprocal phase transitions and like just this is a new paradigm to think about phase transitions. So one thing we decided to do was uh, you can change this. Uh, I mean that the, again the non-reciprocal interactions come from the fact that you have this. Um, particles that have a certain rotation frequency. So what if we mix uh, different particles at different stages? And of course you can play this game of like not only uh, introducing um, different uh, or so we start with identical particles but you can introduce two identities which basically is the time difference between them in development or you can kind of like um, play uh, this game. And what we see like this is an example of what we see. So this is two types of particles uh, what we see is first of all, like the first cluster forms, you have some small, like smaller ones for, uh, come on the boundary, but then 
then you actually see that like the, another cluster of the other particle form. So you have this coexistence of the two phases. We have other examples where uh, if, if they're too far away from each other, actually you get two, uh, two completely different like um, phase separated um, uh, kind of uh, system. And then if they're very close, then you actually have a mixed uh, state. And so this is, uh, again, for us, it's just uh, a really interesting way to start thinking about phase transition in terms of like the strength of the non-reciprocal interactions. And, and of course, ultimately the goal is to um, be able to do this global mechanical deformation measure like this moduli. And, and this is an example. It's also one other really interesting thing that we see is like if um, I'm, I don't have like the better video here, but again, like you can see that if we confine, so we, we have now these experiments that we can confine these crystals and then apply either a step um, kind of compression or an oscillatory ex, um, kind of um, compression. And there again, like there's like a range of different things that we really need to think about and analyze and of course um, kind of try to understand. And um, yes, so with that, I'm gonna, oh, maybe just I will advertise. If you want to hear from other um, research um, kind of uh, directions in my group, I'm gonna give our physics colloquium. Um, so it's also available on webcast. So uh, let me advertise for that. And of course, uh, I will um, say that everything I talked about today is just done by a wonderful group of uh, uh, graduate students in my group, um, PLS postdoc fellows, and then um, my uh, collaborator, Jorn, and in particular, Alex Mitke, who has been um, kind of really our um, kind of helping us with this. And also, let me say, I'm very glad Vincenzo here because his group has been very generous with their time answering our emails about everything when we try to really understand uh, the theory and kind of like try to really move uh, in this direction. And with that, I will be happy to answer other questions. Thank you. Maybe are any more questions? A lot of questions on the way. I have a question about the uh, MIT colloquia. Is that in person or is that also virtual? Um, it's in person, so of course, um, I think Harvard, uh, can, you you can you can part, you can kind of like come uh, in person. So, but but it's also available on webcast. I would love to see you in person. That would be great. So, okay. good. Great. I think we've exhausted questions. So, thank you again, Nikta. For the yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Nikta. Beautiful yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me. Bye, everyone. Right. Safe travels. Thanks.